Hey guys. Since I visited Germany and I'm now in Sweden, I've been noticing that people here are extremely helpful and kind, which I mentioned in former videos. So I've become really interested in how they have so willingly adopted a position that abdicates their homelands to invaders. I'd heard about the warrior gene before, so if you're unfamiliar with this, it comprises particular variations in the X chromosome gene that produces monoamine oxidase A, MAOA, um, which is an enzyme that affects the neurotransmitters dopamine, uh, norepinephrine and serotonin. Of course, there are also environmental factors that contribute to criminality and violence and aggression. I would certainly argue that being raised in a poor and oppressive country would be such a factor. But the warrior gene isn't just an abstract theory. Um, there are genetic reasons that people are predisposed to violent behavior. And I would liken this to alcoholism. Many people are predisposed to it uh, that never develop an addiction, but those that are and have the influence of environmental factors will almost always become alcoholics. So a person that doesn't have such a predisposition but does experience negative environmental factors will likely not develop alcoholism. I understand the warrior gene. It makes sense to me logistically because it is rooted in furthering your species and in survival. But there must be a flip side to this, right? Um, so I started to wonder, is there an altruism gene? And if there is, is this the affliction that I've been witnessing in Germany and Sweden? I found a most fascinating study conducted by two biologists and a neuroscientist, which I've linked below. It states that, quote, studies of altruism and sociality in humans have reported strong effects of oxytocin and vasopressin allelic variation and experimental oxytocin administration on a variety of altruistic social phenotypes. These considerations suggest that genes affecting altruism in humans may be represented as the set of functional genetic variants and thereby influence neurodevelopment, personality traits, and expression of altruistic behaviors. So that basically means that this gene-linked altruism exhibited in social beings does not lay dormant. Rather, they express themselves functionally in brain development and personality traits that lend to altruistic behavior. This also means that the trade-offs between self-oriented and altruistic behavior may influence phenotypic evolution in social animals. So they later summarize, quote, Students of social evolution are now poised to discover and characterize the genes for altruism, postulated 50 years ago by Hamilton. In social insects, altruism genes direct the evolution of thresholds and trade-offs between reproducing, contrasted with helping, and the evolution of the specialized selfish reproductive versus highly social and largely altruistic suites of queen helper phenotypes that result. Among humans, genetically based altruism may also involve trade-offs. Here, between non-social, self-focused cognition and behavior versus pro-sociality and altruism. As Hamilton opined, People divide roughly, it seems to me, into two kinds, or rather, a continuum is stretched between two extremes. There are things people, and there are people people. I think that what Hamilton means here is that people fall roughly into two categories. One is a group of people that are less compassionate and are resource focused. And the other is a group of more fundamentally altruistic people that focus on benefiting their kin, even at the expense of their resources, um, like much of the native Western European population. Of course, there are exceptions with all groups. I am merely postulating based on this study. When doing some further research, I became more familiar with Richard Dawkins and have been looking into his theory that altruism is the manifestation of the so-called selfish gene. So he notes that altruism exists in nature only in terms of protected kinship or kin selection or in terms of reciprocal altruism. This makes sense because there's no stronger desire than to protect your offspring, which is a survival instinct. And in the case of reciprocal altruism, since other animals will return your generosity, perhaps at a later date when you're in dire need. And this is pretty common in the animal kingdom. You see apes give other apes their resources, and later the latter will come to the aid of the former by extending some of their resources. But Dawkins also points out that humans seem even kinder than the animal kingdom, and that we have a strong desire to offer kindness to complete strangers who are not part of our kin. I think altruism has been favored by kin selection in small groups in nature. But when it comes to humans, something special is going on. We've gone beyond kin selection. Our world now has been scaled up. We live amongst large, anonymous populations of strangers, not kin who share our genes, and not people who we might expect to return favors. And yet we still have a lust to be nice. 
the rule that's built into your brain says be nice to everyone you meet mm -hmm. and that works in nature because everyone you meet is going to be part of the small group similarly everyone you meet is actually probably going to be a cousin so when I see a, another human being in distress weeping or something like that I have an almost uncontrollable urge to go and console to maybe you know put my arm around them what's the matter how can I help um, please let me help you and that's a a strong inner urge, which as a Darwinian, I believe has ancestral roots in, in a past. When I lived in small groups like this, small bands, in which I was likely to be surrounded by kin or surrounded by individuals who could reciprocate, I no longer am. This person who is weeping is a complete stranger to me. They will never reciprocate. And yet the lust is still there. I can't help it. Why are humans often so good to complete strangers? Could it be because our selfish genes are in some sense, a blessed sense, misfiring? This, for me, is the antidote to the darkness some have seen in our Darwinian heritage. And it goes further. The joy of being conscious human beings is that we rise above our origins. Our misfiring selfish genes mean we don't ape the nastiness of nature, but extract ourselves from it and live by our values. He views this exclusively human compulsion to extend kindness to non-reciprocating strangers as a positive and a reassuring quality of humanity, and a shining example of how we have transcended the harsh, absolute laws of nature. But he fails to examine, although I'm newly familiar with his work, so maybe he has talked about this, um, the obvious outcome of such behavior, which is that you invariably compromise the stability and the perpetuation of your in-group by extending finite resources to an unfamiliar and very often hostile out-group. Modern humans, and for this purpose I am speaking mostly about Swedes and Germans, although this is broadly applicable to Western Europeans and Americans and Canadians, do very often give without any chance for reciprocity, or worse, with the expectation of the degradation of their own society. And this is clearly the case with migrants who leech off the government, commit crime against the native population, have virtually no respect for Western culture, and do not contribute morally or economically to their host society. So while Dawkins would argue that our kindness to strangers is a mystical expression of the uniqueness and beauty of mankind, at this point, I would have to counter that it is actually a manifestation of forced abandonment of in-group preferences in favor of a stated government diversity initiative. I'll let this cute science nerd do a little more explaining here. So she uses chocolate to represent resources needed to increase offspring output, which is the MO of basically every species. But Darwinian selection says that individuals should act selfishly to produce their own offspring, not help others. One alternative theory was group selection. If everyone in the group is altruistic and shares their chocolates, everyone in the group will benefit, making the whole group successful so the group will be selected for. But critics pointed out that this was not an evolutionarily stable strategy, or ESS. Imagine that a mutant individual is born who does not share their own chocolates with the group, but does take the chocolates from everybody else. More chocolates means more offspring, so the selfish individual and their selfish offspring do much better than the altruistic ones, until eventually you get back to a group of selfish individuals. Enter Bill Hamilton. What Hamilton realised was that if two individuals are related, then they share genes. This means that from a genetic point of view, when you give away your chocolates or potential offspring, you're not left with nothing in return. The extra offspring that your relative makes with your chocolates can be seen as partly yours, since they share some of the same genes as you. Richard Dawkins took it further and said that there are two types or viewpoints for natural selection. Firstly, there is the gene or replicator. Genes are selected for if they replicate and make more copies of themselves faster than any other gene. You can see that if two new genes, red and green, replicate in a population, the one that replicates faster, the red, takes over until every individual in the population contains this gene and the gene becomes fixed. Therefore, everything is for the good of the gene. The mutant individual theory that she speaks of is also applicable to outgroup infiltrators who behave in the same way. Group selection, which is giving up some of your resources to help others in your group, 
was pervasive in German and Swedish cultures before this flood of migrants. Sweden had a kind of self-proclaimed utopia, which although clearly socialist, worked well in a society of like-minded and similar individuals. There was a genuine sense of kinship and duty to the community, and they felt like what they put in, they also got back. Of course, this was completely eroded when refugees were accepted and were allowed to disrupt their system of group selection. And we know, because of the stated intentions of Islamists, that their objective, like this chick's food coloring experiment, is to dominate the West through the conquest of Native European women. This imam, uh, Muhammad Ayed, outlines the hidden intentions of Muslim migration to the West very succinctly. <laughs> وتريد طاقة بشرية ولا أقوى من طاقتنا البشرية نحن المسلمين كذلك أوروبا كل أقطارها كلهم تقطر قلوبهم حقدا على المسلمين يتمنون لنا الموت ولكنهم فقدوا إخصابهم ويبحثون عن إخصاب عندنا سنخصبهم وسوف ننسل وسوف ننجب منهم لأننا سوف نفتح بلادهم رغم أنوفكم يا أيها الألمان يا أيها الأمريكان يا أيها الفرنسيون يا أيها الطليان يا كل من على وزن الطليان خذوا اللاجئين سنطلبهم منكم قريبا باسم دولة الخلافة القادمة وسنقول لكم هؤلاء أبناؤنا أرسلوهم أو نرسل لكم جيوشا Okay, now back to our cute science nerd. The controversy is caused by how those genes go about replicating themselves. As they can't do this on their own, they need a body or vehicle to help them. Genes can either get their own vehicle to make lots of copies of itself, i.e. a selfish, chocolate-hogging individual that produces lots of offspring, or the gene can get another vehicle also containing the same gene to make lots of offspring, i.e. altruism. So she is saying that genes can either be propagated by introducing a vehicle that hoards resources and has many children, in this case migrants, or they can be altruistic and encourage procreation within their gene pool, or in-group in this instance, through group selection, like the socialist systems in Germany and Sweden that redistributed resources and created an environment that encouraged native procreation. I may finally understand what has happened in Western Europe. I think that most of these folks have a genetic predisposition towards altruism. Paired with generations of race-based guilt, as well as cultural Marxist indoctrination basically from birth, a type of compulsive empathy was developed that is so strong that it has squelched the most basic survival instincts of self-preservation and procreation. And in this softness, an aggressive, exploited force, Islam, has filled the vacuum, and these fighting age male migrants are acutely aware that Europe is ripe for the picking. That is why they are there. Maybe this is just the nature of homeostasis. We need a healthy dose of social Darwinism, which Richard Dawkins detests because it flies in the face of his illusion that we have risen above our animalistic tendencies through elevated morality. We have lost the connection to the base, which like it or not, keeps us alive. I understand the temptation to reject the animal nature of humanity and want to distance yourself from it. No species has accomplished what we have or achieved even a fraction of our truly remarkable advancements. But what is base about us also built us. It made us whole. It is the foundation for our greatness. And it is an inescapable part of our very existence. If we ever want to be in a position again where we can freely extend altruism to outgroups, then we simply cannot allow ourselves and our cultures to be eradicated. So thank you for watching. I'm still in Sweden. Um, next stop is Amsterdam, and then the trip is pretty open, so I will continue reporting. I would like to get more on-the-ground footage, but I am just really nervous about filming people, so I apologize for that, and I'll try to do a better job in the future. So thanks, and I'll see you soon. Bye!